The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Financial advisors help Australians live better lives, and we're great at it. But what about us? For us to thrive in the coming years, I'm here to ask a very big question. How can we live better, run better businesses, and help more clients along the way? My name is Jessica Brady, and I would love for you to join me as I listen and learn from experts who answer these very big questions. I am lucky enough to record most of my podcasts on Gadigal Land. This episode is brought to you by Australian Retirement Trust, a fund that's more super for you and your clients. With more than 2 million members and over $200 billion under management, they have more access to super smart investments at home and abroad. They're committed to working with over 4,000 advisors and delivering a world of investment opportunities to help your clients live the retirement they want. Visit australianretirementtrust.com.au forward slash advisor. Include Super Savings and Q Super FUM and members at June 2022. Now the phrase transition to retirement, it's certainly one that we hear a lot in our world. But what does it actually take to transition? And I mean not just from a financial perspective. How can people make sure that they are setting themselves up to live happy, healthy lives in retirement? Well, to answer this question, I am joined this week by none other than Natalie Yan Chatonsky. She is the founder and CEO of Full Time Lives. We talk about the concept of retirement, how people can continue to bring meaning and purpose to their life post work, and what we as advisors can do to help our clients through the transition. Hi, Natalie. Hi, Jess. I'm really excited for today's chat. We are going to have a very, very interesting, juicy conversation. One that I don't personally have enough because of specifically what you do and the the people that you help isn't necessarily who I've looked after before, but I am fascinated both on a personal and professional front. And so I want to upfront say thank you. And it's going to be, I think, really helpful for many financial advisors. So, for the people who don't know who you are, uh-huh. perhaps it's good to start with, who are you and a little bit about your story? Sure. So I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Full Time Lives mm-hmm. that I founded a bit over five years ago. And um, the business currently as it stands is serving midlife women mm-hmm. in helping them design a meaningful and connected lifestyle. And the reason why we're focused on this particular aspect of all the different changes that women are going through at midlife when, you know, they're empty nesting and Mm. got elderly parents they might have to care for and maybe thinking about career change or ageism that's happening in the workforce. There's all kinds of challenges, which makes it really interesting, challenging and exciting and daunting all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like it's a really important stage that if you can get it right in terms of thinking about the big picture of where you're going to go in the second half of your life, you're really well set up from a health perspective, having the right networks that are going to support you to do big, meaningful work. Mm. And it doesn't have to be just paid work. It can be, um, you know, work that makes you feel purposeful, Mm -hmm. Um, the combination of all of that's really important to set up early in your life, in your 30s and 40s, leading up to your 50s and 60s. Where did did this come from? Like how did you get to a path where you were like, this is a huge big piece of someone's life that is not transitioned well Mm -hmm. in, in Australia today? Like how did that come about for you? It was probably a combination of a few thing, uh, you know, personal experience as well as professional um, early days of working on my startup, Full Time Lives. Mm. Back then, um, I was in a job in financial services doing lots of customer interviews with banking operational stuff. Mm. So I was working on a new payments platform and we were trying to understand the needs of 
the operational staff in bank branches of mutual banks. Mm -hmm. So I was going around to all these different branches of mutual banks and trying to understand how they felt about digitizing parts of their jobs. And you think that that would be really exciting, like mm. having a lot of the stuff, that the manual tasks automated, high accuracy and all the repetitive tasks um, being taken care of and a lot faster by machine. What I was really most shocked about is that the people I interviewed who were mostly women were really scared of that change. Mm. They'd been in their roles for at least 20, 30 years, were very comfortable, loved their jobs because it was customer facing. They either spoke to customers who came to their branches or served them over the phone in really critical situations. And they thought that maybe this would mean the beginning of being made redundant. Okay. And also um, just the idea of change when they'd been doing things the same way, using all those banking legacy systems mm. for many years, mm. really threatened them. And I thought, hmm, that's a really different kind of insight from what I was expecting when I kind of first set up my, you know, what what did I want to learn about them? Because I thought it was more about learning about the user experience of how should we design the interface of this new software. Mm. And so that just really sat with me um, in terms of that reaction. Uh, you know, there were, you know, some women who I still remember being really teary and I said, I'm not here to make you redundant. I'm here to really make it a great work experience once this new new payments platform you know gets set up and your your bank's going to be using these new systems um so that was on the professional front and in the meantime my family had been having conversations about my dad retiring mm. um and he's always been in the same job all his life he's very passionate about his work he's a doctor um he's community, his friends are all other doctors, mm. and everything's to do with his job. And my mum, on the other hand, um, she's, I guess, in many ways has supported him and cared for him and his needs and been the organiser and cooks for him and, you know, does all of the holiday planning and also played a role in managing the clinic to make sure it was successful from a business point of view. So my mum was really concerned about what would happen once my dad retired and he'd be at home every day with her. Mm -hmm. And so and I, she was calling me at work and I was thinking, oh, my God, this is going to become a problem for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it just it was those two totally different things of observing how people working for a bank as well as someone like my dad, a doctor, who had been in the same jobs for decades, or most of their working lives, mm. they were the ones who felt the most threatened by the change and it had an impact on those around them as well, like mm -hmm. my mum. Mm -hmm. So I guess that was kind of the beginning of doing much more customer research specifically for my business in understanding what is it to transition to retirement mm -hmm. and how do you do it well? Mm. And it's not just about the health and the money aspect there's the lifestyle aspect, which no one talks about. Totally. So over the last five years, really focused on running programs, having facilitating conversations amongst people at a similar stage in life. It's less about age, but more about that stage of finished full-time work, moving into what I call full-time living. Mm. And, um, and what was fascinating and facilitating all those conversations is those aha moments that come up predictably each time I have hold these conversations. Mm -hmm. And so some of the insights that I can share with you would be um, there's always a big debate around spontaneity versus planning. Mm -hmm. And so everyone's very heated about their style of how, how far out do you plan your life your money and careers mm -hmm. and try and control everything. Mm -hmm. And that's always very interesting and there's no real answer other than perhaps being ready for change because that's a constant. Yeah. And being able to respond in the moment. So that's where spontaneity and adaptability is really important. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you still need to be prepared and not be surprised by things that are likely to happen. Mm. So... 
Um, so just being aware of where the world's going and how you're going to fit in with the wider world of change, I think a lot of that hasn't been, I guess, put in front of people to think about early enough. It's not until it's too late that mm. people start to get challenged around the issues of ageing, um, ageing in place, and also, I guess, uh, the financial aspect around that mm. because the number of times that people have shared their stories around having done a C or tree change and it was a wrong decision for them mm. financially as well as lifestyle was. Lifestyle was it's mostly because they didn't set, some, set themselves up well because they didn't get to know that community. Mm. They really underplayed the community aspect of moving to a new place. Mm. And, you know, having heard enough very similar stories and the regrets that people have, I got really curious as to, well, what's the alternative? How can we do things better? How can we actually inform people early enough so that it reduces that risk of making those big mistakes later in life that mm -hmm. are sometimes going to, not always irreversible, but just more difficult. Life is, you know, harder because they made the wrong choices too early in life. Mm. Um, so for me, it's about making people aware and having the right conversations early, not much later on when maybe they were kind of linking these sorts of decisions around just like that pre-retirement age. Mm. And pre-retirement is really long. Mm. So um, I find that generally people wait until they're just a few years off from retirement. And so that's why I've really decided to focus on midlife because it can be fun. You've got time to try different things, work out what's right for you, really get to know yourself outside of your skin of your work persona mm. and be able to um, use, like if you have the opportunity to access sabbaticals, take career breaks, be proactive about what you're going to do in those times other than just do a hol have a normal holiday, mm. be productive in that time mm -hmm. and, you know, have a taste of all your other interests and activities and invest in building out new networks outside of work and your industry. You know what I find fascinating about this conversation? We put the concept of retirement on this huge, shiny pedestal like it's an Olympic medal to reach the retirement phase of someone's life. And we have all these visions of what retirement means for us. And obviously it's individualistic oh. and everyone's own retirement plans are different. But what we don't talk enough about is all of the things that you're saying, the loss of identity, the loneliness, the transition uh, and lack of community, who is often the people that you associate with from a work mm -hmm. perspective, the fact that you've upped roots and moved to a brand new town and you know no one and think playing golf on Wednesdays is going to be the answer. And sadly, you're staring down the barrel of what should be this perfect life and it feels like you're discombobulated and you probably feel a bit of shame about it because on the outside you've done all the things that make you look like you've reached this amazing milestone and yet you're feeling really disconnected and lonely. Mm. Is that Absolutely. Right? And that's the pain point that I'm trying to address with my business. It's really sad uh, when people get to that stage and then they look back at what they could have done. Mm. So that the, I, when I hear stories like that, and I've spoken to so many people, whether it's been customer interviews or in group discussions, and all the evidence is there of what could happen if you didn't prepare when you were young enough. This is fascinating. So I want to know whether you think, oh, firstly, congrats on the book. Oh, thank you. I've read the book. <laughs> I'm learning that to have great podcasts, you must read the book first. <laughs> so I've read the book. Huge congrats. Thanks. I'd love to dive into some of the components that you talk about in the book in more detail. Mm -hmm. I also think financial advisors, if you have people who are in this midlife who are thinking about the next phase and realize that they aren't their job, this is a great book, particularly for women to really challenge that and give them, I thought the exercises and the, the practical questions that people should work through uh -huh. was really great. So uh -huh. huge congrats to you. One of the things you talk about in the book, and I want to sort of lean into is 
the idea that we are so much more than our job mm-hmm. and that other cultures do this quite well. Yeah. I want to talk Australia specific. Do you think that we place too much emphasis on who we are as our identity through a job? Absolutely. Um, I've travelled a lot and particularly working on full-time lives and doing lots of research tours around the world, that's been my observation of communities that have long, healthy, happy lives and really supportive communities. People are so much more than the job they had from, you know, post-uni right through to their 60s. They've got links with their community. They're well-respected. They have multiple interests Mm. that aren't just to serve them in order to access certain networks or skills. It's Some of it's just for pure enjoyment, whether it's an art or a sport or a combination of a few different activities. They're so much more interesting. Yes. When, uh, when you start a conversation with a stranger in somewhere like Iceland, where I was a couple of months ago, or in France, because my f- husband's French, all these different cultures that really revere people who are well-rounded. Yeah. And it, like in, in French culture, you never ask someone, what do they do for work? It's really rude. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so my husband taught me very early on, if we're going to a dinner party, whatever you do, don't ask them what they do for their job. And you're like, in Australia, this is literally one of the top three questions that we ask people when we meet them, which is so bad because yeah. we're trying to categorise people into a job. Yeah. And like just this past weekend, I was at a school reunion and I was very conscious not to use that question because you can't assume someone is necessarily in a job at that point in time mm. or uh, the or they're necessarily happy in that job and Mm. it's a really bad way to start a conversation Mm. because it's assuming a whole bunch of social conventions around success. So, But if you can start a conversation that's less about what they do for a living but more about who they are as a whole person and what sort of things interest them, what's on their mind, that's a much deeper conversation you can get into and you never know what comes out of it. So, yeah, so uh, I, that's my observation about Australian culture. We just put too much emphasis on our jobs in terms of the time that we spend as well as the planning that we put around it and then also how we use that as our kind of how we present ourselves to the world. And, of course, then when you retire, because you've hung so much of your identity on that job, that would feel like you've lost who you are. Absolutely. There's a massive void. So that Mm. loss of identity creates an emotional void. Mm. There's quite a lot of research around high incidence of depression Mm. in much older men uh, who have been retired for a while, like men in their 80s, Okay. and suicide rates. So that's a real concern. Really? Yeah. Whoa. And that, so we, we hear a lot of the stats around young men mm. and suicide over the last few years, but it has been reported for a very long time around high suicide rates of much older men who've been retired for a while. So we obviously need to do a better job of helping people in this stage of their life. In your book, you talk about human-centred design uh-huh. and taking that approach to retirement. Before we get to the retirement piece, For us novices over here, can you help us understand what is human-centred design? Sure. So it's a approach that we take in order to understand the customer, not just from a functional point of view in terms of what sort of features and functions and pricing that you should put around a product or a service. Mm. It's actually also thinking about what pain points, what are their emotional needs, thinking about the human at the core of every product or service that you design, build, iterate on, maintain if the product's been in market for a while. Okay. So it's it's a repeatable process to start with the customer, do lots of research around them by observing, interviewing them, then coming up with new products and services to meet that human's needs. Mm-hmm. And, and then it's also about testing and learning with that co-designing with that customer. With real humans. Yeah, and ideally with the people who are eventually going to use and buy your product. And so how has this approach 
or how can we bring this approach into retirement? So it's actually bringing yourself and those around you into your planning process. So similarly, you would start off by identifying what is it about me? What are my strengths? What are my likes and dislikes? And how do I engage with the world? How do I fit in with my environment, my family, my community, and what's missing? So it's also aligning it with where you want to go. So your vision, your goals and aspirations and dreams, trying to align where you're at now, what's stopping you from achieving all those things that you would love to do or be. Mm -hmm. And then trying to figure out, okay, what are the pain points, stumbling blocks that could be alleviated? Unblock those in order to move forward. Mm -hmm. So the thing that I often hear people talk about at this stage in life is feeling stuck Mm. because there's so many choices. Mm. And also if they don't know themselves well enough in terms of where they want to go, as well as what, what what, what's going on in the environment and where the world's going, there's a lot of information that they're trying to rationalize and try and, you know, figure out from a really rational point of view. But if you can start to really think and feel and lean into what would, if you could have anything in the world to design your future self and, you know, the life that you have in a few decades, if you can eliminate all the issues, what would that look like for starters? And then once you've got clarity around your vision, what are the steps that you can take in order to get there and just keep on breaking it down? So it's still following a quite a structured approach of iterating and moving towards where you ultimately want to go. But it's, it's that whole process of trying to try something small. Don't do the whole thing. Just take an aspect of it. Mm -hmm. One piece, see how that goes. If it goes well, keep going with it. If it didn't go so well, then change it. Mm. And then, but still don't give up your dream, but try another way to mm. get w- where you want to go. It's, it's really interesting when you're talking about all of these. I mean, these are the conversations that financial advisors are having with people mm-hmm. a lot. And obviously it's because we're trying to understand from a financial mm. perspective, how do we make sure that you've got enough money mm. and you're not going to run out of money? We, we can plan for that. But it's work. And it's hard work and it's confronting work and it's scary. And often I know, and these are not people that I talk to that are in retirement phase yet or even thinking about retirement phase yet, this can be really confronting Yeah, and it can be really um, challenging when you realise that the person that you're on this journey with has a really different Uh belief set or vision of what it is that they want to do and it requires you to carve out space And I would imagine that at this stage in people's lives, that is really hard too, to make sure that actually people are taking the time to step back and say, cool, I know that there's a million other ways that I'm getting pushed, but actually I need to be selfish and I need to take time out to carve out and forge who I want to be. Which brings me to my next point around women specifically, because we know that they get pulled in many directions and they do the majority of, excuse me, the unpaid labor in homes and they are sandwiched often between adult children who probably still live at home and maybe some aging parents who have additional needs as well. You talk about in the book, and I this was like a little bit of a light bulb for me, men, your decision to focus on women, which we're going to come to, but men often have almost like a linear sort of pattern throughout their life. They study and then often they work yeah. in an unbroken fashion and then they retire. And what you talk about specifically, and please correct me if I've misinterpreted this, but this idea of sort of reinventing or getting ready for this new transition perhaps is easier for women because we have had to make often many pivots and shifts in terms of who we are and what we do and how we work. And so you actually say that it's easier for women because of this. Mm. Say more. They're probably less attached to that one linear track that they know Mm. because they've been surprised along the way and had to adjust for others. Yeah. That that's actually a really great skill to have right now in terms of, well, no one really knows what's going to happen in terms of health events, either Mm. your own health or people around you. So I think women have had more time to reflect and 
get ready or if something's been sprung on them, then at least they're in a better position to be able to drop work in order to, you know, whether it's having to look after a sick or unwell family member Mm -hmm. or taking time out to care for children, to raise children, whatever it might be, it is something that's probably a bit more natural and socially acceptable. Mm, Because there's precedence. Yeah. yeah. Whereas I think what we've seen over the last few years, we're seeing more young men and fathers be be able to kind of have those benefits because employers are also recognising, well, you've got to give parental leave to both men and women. Yes. In order to close that gender divide yes. at work, so there's some really positive things happening for the younger generation. Um, but I guess there's some entrenched ideas around gender differences in the older age bracket, where there's still that aspiration for people to retire, and you know, um, men feeling like they can't ask for time off or having that flexibility of reducing their hours because they, they perceive that, oh, well, maybe I won't be taken seriously at work if I'm only working part-time, whereas it's more acceptable for women to have asked for part-time work. Mm, I think there's two things I want to talk about here. First one is I totally get it that women have had to almost reinvent themselves along their life, you know, period of career. Maybe they then became a mother, and I'm doing that in inverted commas, and then, you know, the constant iteration. However, almost at odds with that is because often they are really busy, do you find that they are, they take, that it's hard for them to take the time that they need to, to design the next phase Yeah. Of so this life? is where in many ways we're really well set up to keep reinventing, yeah. but of course it's reactionary. So you're right, that's the hard thing and why it's so interesting at this midlife stage when perhaps they, being in the sandwich generation, the children are starting to leave home, be less dependent on them, or at least don't require so much time from mm, them. Mm. Um, and, you know, I guess um, elderly parents. But then once you kind of go beyond that stage of that next chapter and thinking about that, what am I going to do when I don't have to like serve other people and care for other people and think about herself, it, often it's kind of taking what she can get right there and then and not necessarily thinking, okay, is this the right move for me for the next few 5, 10, 20 years? So that's probably something that it's more a reaction to what they've just come out of and taking what they can as opposed to really thinking about how am I going to future-proof myself Mm. for the longer run. Mm. And that might mean having to extend that break, that career break, if they've taken that career break to reskill. Yeah. It might mean taking a bit of a, um, a detour career wise to go and get experience in a parallel area that's growing, an emerging sort of industry or profession. Because mm-hmm. maybe she thinks a little bit ahead that whatever profession she's in isn't going to sustain her from a health and wellness perspective there's risk of burnout or that industry is already changing due to technology change or you know it's Mm. it's not something she wants to do anymore so there's lots of considerations interesting the second part of that was as you were talking before my brain was thinking about many of the people that are listening are employers Mm -hmm. and it seems to me that there is a really important opportunity to talk to men, particularly men who are getting closer to retirement age, around what does the next phase look like and making sure that they understand that if they want to start stepping down in terms of the amount of hours that they do, that that is safe yeah, and that that is encouraged and that this is a conversation that should be um, a really positive one and not scary because I completely agree with you. There probably is in the older generations so much almost pressure Mm. to need to work full time because that's the done thing. And I think employers probably need to have that psychological safety conversation to help start shifting the paradigm. Otherwise, we're going to be waiting decades before anything really shifts. So that's an action item for us. A question to you is, because obviously we're talking a lot about women, um, and let's be frank, many women can't have 
the traditional retirement mm. because of financial constraints. Mm. But as a more general sort of question, should we retire retirement? Yes, definitely. <laughs> Say more. I loved this topic. Yeah. So I just think that the the reason why retirement models were set up are no longer relevant mm. to modern Australia and in particular for women, modern Australian women. Um, if you think about, you know, it was set up by Bismarck uh, hundreds of years ago, back in the day when most people were in jobs that were um, very labour intensive yeah. and shorter life expectancy. Yeah. So it was a pension system for people who were no longer able to do their physical labour anymore and had outlived the average life expectancy. So it was a way of, it was part of a whole sort of redesigning the welfare state at that point in time. So if you kind of fast track to where we're at here in Australia and people living longer, uh, the average life expectancy for women right now in Australia is 85, but younger generations can expect to live to 100, 100 year life. And the average retirement age in Australia for women is 52, which is shocking. Mm. It's like I really had to double check that stat because mm. I was quite very surprised when I saw that because mm. that's a 30 year gap from the time that people stopped work and no longer looking for a new job and till they pass away. It's a huge chunk it's of time. It's a very long time. And it's a long time to feel isolated, disconnected. To not, not have feel a like, sense of purpose. Yeah, you have a community or purpose. Yeah. And so you've studied these blue zones. Mm -hmm. or, um, so blue zones look at areas in the world where people live to 100, is that right? They're um, places where people have the longest life expectancy. And I want to talk about this concept, and I'm going to say it wrong and you're going to correct me. Ikigai. Yeah. Is that how you say it? Yep. Yeah. The Japanese word for getting out of bed that's what it literally means to get up and um have that sense of purpose and there is a framework isn't there that that sort of almost like a venn diagram mm. of sort of what it takes to live a purposeful life mm -hmm. and i would imagine that the sort of work that you do with people is helping them understand those different facets yeah and like really trying to think about is it the one thing that gives you a sense of purpose is it a combination of a few different things you know there's no set rule, but it's more about thinking about a bunch of different questions that help you get to that answer of defining what gives you that ikigai or sense of purpose. Interesting. So it's things like, what are your strengths? What do you care about the most? Then the external factors are, what does the world need? What does the world value in you? So it's not just important to understand yourself, but it's also that linkage with the world around you because mm. that's how you feel useful, purposeful, mm. valued. And um, you've got to understand where you, you've chosen to contribute to have that sense of belonging and being valued by others. Because if you're not in a place where people are valuing you, that's not, you know, very satisfying. Not so you really got to, if you don't have it right now, then find those new places, whether it's a, a employer or a community or uh, some kind of other group that would value what you've got to offer and what you enjoy and love doing. One of the things that I loved was the conversation that you bring to the forefront around having multi-generational friends. Because mm -hmm. we live in an ageist society. I think it's really important to call that out. I think specifically for women, it's very ageist. And also, again, shout out to those people who are listening, who are employing older people, specifically older women. And if they've had big age, um, big career gaps, understanding that that is quite normal and that they still have a lot of capability and purpose and passion that they can bring to a job. Um, Multi-generational friendships is something that I'm just learning about. Um and you talk a little bit about two-way mentorship. And I uh -huh. think this is hugely undervalued. And I'm like, why don't we all do this? I don't do this. Mm. What is two-way mentorship? So it was popularized by Chip Conley, who wrote the book, The Modern Elder. And he talks a lot about his own relationship with the founder and CEO of Airbnb. So they had for many years a two-way mentorship. It, uh, so, so Chip at the time was in his 50s 
Okay. And he had a very successful career in the hotel industry. He had run a founded and run a business that was a global hospitality business and he retired from that. And then not long after that, he got tapped on the shoulder by the Airbnb founders um, who were in their 20s at the time Mm -hmm. saying, we would really benefit from your leadership skills um, because back then Airbnb was fast growing. And there was that understanding of what an older leader could bring to an organization and what you could learn and harness as a young leader from a much older leader. So he thought he was coming in just to do the mentoring. What he realized was that he learned so much from working with younger people Mm. that it's actually a mutual thing. Mm. And once you let go of your ego and you actually aren't just the one who's imparting information and knowledge and experience, but equally you can learn from other people who may not be of the same generation, uh, there's that mutual respect for each other when it's equal Mm. because you're learning from each other and Mm. you're asking questions about the other person and what they know and what they think and why. And that is incredibly useful in terms of staying relevant. So part of the reason why people might feel like there's a bit of ageism or, you know, they you know, come across in a negative sense is sometimes, you know, they may not necessarily be using the same language or references and that seems to date them. So it is very helpful to be connected and have younger friends and have, you know, sources of information that aren't just within your own circle of people who are the same age because that enriches your opportunities to do new things, learn new things and be challenged totally because you don't necessarily have all the answers and how to fit into this whole new changing world and the vibrancy and energy that i think that that would impart in people both ways mm. is exciting as yeah. well yeah yeah you've done this yeah i do it a lot and i get a lot of joy out of spending time with people in my client base who are older than me hence interviewing a lot of women who are a few steps ahead of me in life for my book But then also I spend time with much younger people and I like to do the two-way mentorship with women in the product management community and the startup community because I feel like, well, we're all startup founders. We're all trying to figure stuff out. There's a lot of benefit of the experience that I can share with people, what I used to do, product management, and also then I guess tapping into the insights they might have around the latest types of platforms and mm. digital solutions. So, you know, that those are the really productive and fun relationships to have that are really meaningful too because we've got a common purpose and trying to achieve very common similar goals but in different ways for our various businesses. I think we all as an action item, I think this is a really important one. In financial advice, the mentorship programs that I've seen are definitely one way. Mm. I think it would probably be accidentally mm-hmm. somewhat two ways, but I think being quite overt in that is is unique and I think a huge opportunity for us. You were quite structured or you are quite structured about how you approach those conversations. Definitely. Tell us how to do them. If we're going to go and and, and look at this two-way mentorship, how would you get the best out of that time Um, together? It's probably coming back to what is your ikigai or sense of purpose, Mm. starting with that, understanding yourself. Because once you're really clear about what fulfills you and what your strengths are and what the world needs, then you can then figure out, well, who are the different people that I could share that with and be valued by other people? Mm. And equally, where are some of the gaps? So probably my most recent two-way mentorship has been a younger product manager who has lots of experience in publishing. And so it was a really, like we were very upfront and we were really happy about the matching. And we actually met through our professional association Mm. who have that structured two-way mentorship. So we were very clear in terms of well, this is what I'm seeking, this is what I have to offer you, Mm -hmm. and then, you know, reciprocate. So each time we meet, we take turns in whose challenges we're going to solve, and it's in our diaries. Mm -hmm. So it's all forward booked, 
and it's really clear in the invite whose turn is it is it Nat's turn or is it Usher's turn Mm -hmm. and we have to show up with a problem to discuss and we've Mm -hmm. got the full hour to to cover it and and so it's really fascinating because we started off meeting weekly and then it's now monthly Mm. to hear the progress that how has that person applied what you've shared with them and you know seeing it in their context of their life and their personality and their skill set and that's really fulfilling to see that. And equally, she's been really satisfied to see how I've applied all that she's taught me about how to, you know, I guess not just write the book, but also kind of work on the marketing aspects of it. Mm. So it's been hugely beneficial mm. for both of us from a career point of view, but also just the friendship that comes out of it because it's genuine. It's more equal mm-hmm. as opposed to one person having all the experience that gets shared. And, you know, that's very one-sided and it, it doesn't last if it's just one-sided. A hundred percent. I did a, um, a corporate mentorship in a bank, a large bank, an investment bank. I've only worked at a few, so people probably will know who that is. And I had a really, really, really senior mentor And I was terrified of him, Mm -hmm. terrified because I was scared that I couldn't authentically talk about the problems or challenges or fears that I had because I was really scared that it was going to impact my career, Mm. which is so silly because that's why they're there. And obviously he 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 wasn't a bad guy um, and he probably would have genuinely been able to help me, but I felt really scared to bring authentic conversations to the table because I feared judgment. Mm. And because we didn't have that two-way street. It wasn't a balanced. I really felt um, intimidated, Mm. which is the exact opposite of why you have a mentor. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So we've talked a lot about today, the transition or planning for the transition to retirement. Financial advisors are one of the only people that exist in someone's life to have or start having these conversations with people. Sometimes we force them upon people who are not ready to have Mm. them because they need to be you know, aware of their situation, but we, we often miss a lot of the human element beyond goals, which we're getting better at. Um, but often it's goals related to money. How can advisors hold space for these conversations? How can we be having more of these really important, meaningful chats so that people do have a full time life that is happy and healthy and productive once they stop paid employment? I think it's, financial advisors in a really good position to ask lots of questions but also allow the clients to take time to think about it because just expecting that in an hour they're going to be able to draw out mm. what's their icky guy what's their vision for life and you know um, that's a lot to expect someone to have the answers for if they haven't done the work totally so it's actually giving people the opportunity to maybe break it up over a longer period to think about those questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, whether it's a leave behind or it's giving some homework for the client to think about, um, providing forums for discussion, Mm -hmm. that's probably a good place because I think it's not always just closed conversations. I know that a lot of it's confidential, but the things that people learn in my workshops and discussion groups are incredibly valuable and the reason why I like doing group work is because people learn and observe and getting things out in a group normalizes the fears yeah and that people realize that they're not the only ones experiencing the same sorts of issues everyone's going through it and more often than not people help each other out yeah. in problem solving yeah and it becomes a collective so it doesn't have to be just a one-on-one thing it can actually let's bring the community together let's bring a group of clients together mm. to think through the questions and talk about it openly together. And clients will really appreciate those opportunities to have those open conversations with other people experiencing the same sorts of challenges in that stage of life. I think that that's such an interesting and yet obvious point to start at. Like get people together who are at a similar stage, who are thinking the same things and just hold space to have these conversations, but also do the work. Yeah. Like if you haven't done the work for yourself and if you are staring down this phase of your life and you haven't done the work, it's probably going to become very obvious, but also very inauthentic to then have 
clients Mm. come in and try to help them work through it Mm. because we are kings and queens of often telling what to do and not doing. So I think there's some good action items for me as well on the Ikigai um, front. But I think that that's hugely valuable. I think about my parents, um, I always like to relate this stuff to to real stories. My parents have had a financial advisor for decades. My mum's just recently transitioned to retirement. So reading, reading your book was really interesting through her thinking about her and how much she can offer the world and how wasted some talents are when they retire and they don't realize that there's so much more that they can do. But I just thinking when you were talking, I'm like, gosh, if the advisor for my parents had had or can have these sort of sessions or opportunities to learn, I really think my parents would A, go, B, find it beneficial and C, it would be a stickier relationship. I'm not sure that you would do it for that, but I think it would be. I think so, definitely, because if you've helped people prepare for their second half of life in a way that's really meaningful and satisfying, then there's so much value in that. Huge. And we actually know that a lot of women leave a financial advisor if their male partner dies, Mm. which tells me that there's a connection Mm. value problem with a lot, not everyone, but a Mm. lot of people do that. And so this can be a really great way to connect with someone that perhaps isn't the, the lead front on the financial decision um, meeting perspective as well. Mm. Interesting. Now, I'm going to ask you a couple of rapid fire questions, but before we do, thank you so much for today. And how can people learn more about you, your work, and your book? Probably best to come to our website, fulltimelives.com. Mm-hmm. Um, I do have a white paper for financial advisors, five tips to um, manage your 100-year life. Mm-hmm. So um, we can put it in the show notes. Yes, let's put it in the show notes. Yeah. That would be fantastic. We'll yeah. have a link to that and we'll have a link to your website Okay, as Perfect. well. Uh, are you ready for some rapid fire Absolutely. questions? Absolutely. Okay. First question is, Nat, what's one thing that you do look to look after your mental health? I do a combination of different things. Mm-hmm. Brazilian jiu-jitsu mm-hmm. five times a week. Five times a week? Yes. Do you really do jiu-jitsu five? Do not mess with her. <laughs> five times a week. That's amazing. That is amazing. I also do yoga about twice a week. Wow. And I have an acupuncture session about once a fortnight. Yeah. I meditate and I journal. So it's a combination of a few different things um, and having a really tight weekly structure so that I prioritize all of those ways of um, looking after my health and well-being. You have a morning routine, don't you? Um, look, I do have a morning routine. Like It's where I decide to journal, that can vary, but essentially the activities I do in the morning are you know, more or less the same every day, even on the weekends. Mm-hmm. What is a piece of advice that you'd give to younger Natalie? I would say don't worry too much about what people think. I think I worried too much when I was younger and now that I'm in my live midlife and everything I know now and the last few years I've learned so much more from older people, I realise if you can just let go of all hang-ups and judgment and worrying about other people think you can just get on with what's really important to you. I heard this saying a little while ago and it changed me. It said, what other people think of you is none of your business. (laughs) And I was like, oh my gosh, it is none of my business. If they don't like me, I don't care. It's none of my business. It was quite profound for me. Um, Is there something that's on your bucket list, a big item that you haven't ticked off yet? Um, So I've been to two of the five blue zones. Mm. I'm still working through the rest. Obviously, the pandemic has stopped me. So I want to get back onto my bucket list of visiting the three remaining blue zones. Amazing. And last question for you is, do you have a book to recommend for me to read as part of my fake book club? I think you should definitely read The 100 Year Life by Linda Grattan and Andrew Scott. It touches on what we need to be thinking about now that we're living longer. Amazing. I haven't read that, so I shall add that to the list. Natalie, today has been such a great conversation. Thank you so much for imparting your knowledge to the XY community. Thank you so much for having me. And I look forward to hearing from advisors coming to our website and have any queries. Thank you. Thank you.